Fashion Tech Alliance involves higher educational institutions, small, medium and big enterprises and the research center. This project has been co-founded by the Erasmus Plus program of the European Union and is aimed to facilitate knowledge exchange between partners and to design and pilot learning experiences to engage students in a Fashion Tech Residency program, embedding young talents in the company's innovation activities. A central objective of the project is to design multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary and intersectoral learning activities involving international students from five European universities. The contents of the lectures have been specifically created to match the needs of fashion tech learning. They have become open educational resources to allow future engagement between a European-wide fashion and textile HEI community and are available under Creative Commons Sharealike 4.0 with the aim of a wide and free distribution, access, use and reuse. Ready to learn more about fashion tech? Enjoy the lecture! Hello, my name is Douglas Atkinson and I'm a lecturer in wearable technology at London College of Fashion. In this presentation, I'm going to be talking to you about social imaginaries of emerging technology and near future technology. And what that really means is to explore the way that socially our perceptions of new technologies are either influenced or in some ways predetermined by our culture and by the kind of worlds of social interactions and media which we live in. So, there's a reason for exploring this in relation to our design process, because sometimes it can mean that we almost pre-design things, or it can mean that we ignore some of the social considerations that will mean an emerging or new technology is either accepted or not wanted, not used by consumers. And that's really critical when we're working with new ideas for wearable technology. So this lecture will be divided into four themes. First, I'm going to talk to you about the idea of the history of the future and how we have ideas already kind of preconceived of both the aesthetics and also some of the functionalities we expect from future technologies. After that, I'm going to introduce the concept of the socio-technical imaginary. And this is a way of looking at shared beliefs and understandings that we have around technologies. Uh, through a particularly kind of social science lens. Then I'm going to introduce a case study from some of the work that I've been part of for my PhD research with the InTouch project. And this was exploring socio-technical imaginaries of new technologies which can communicate or kind of capture, record and transmit touch. So there I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how we try to understand people's socio-technical imaginaries through different design processes. And then finally, I'm going to end the lecture by introducing Gartner's hype cycle, which is a way of plotting the media hype that uh, technology has within society. And hype is quite important in thinking about why we might choose to design with a technology or why we might choose not to use another technology. And so it's really kind of critical to understand whether we're wanting to work with a technology because of the hype attached to it or because it's genuinely useful for our design process. So to begin, I'm going to ask you a question. And it may seem like an unusual question, but what do you already know about the future? And if you think about this, you have more of an idea of what you expect from the future than you might at first realize. So what does the future look like? And how does the future work? This is a classic fashion example. But generally speaking, when we think of ideas of new uh, kind of futuristic looking things, we think back to 1960s modernism. We think back to very clean lines, very simple shapes, and very minimal detailing. But the fashions of the 60s were also very interesting in this respect because they did use a lot of new textile technologies. And this was a period when there was a lot of optimism around new technology, a lot of hope for new technology. And so that's kind of become almost a cultural idea of the semiotics that we attach to the new and to the future. 
There have been other movements that have influenced our views of the future. For instance, cyberpunk, which is a more dystopian view of futuristic ideas of the world and ideas of clothing and ideas of technology. But generally speaking, there are some fairly similar aesthetics that run through all of these things. And they can actually be dated back a long way. So this is a very classic example as well. Um, but the robot Maria in Fritz Lang's Metropolis is generally considered to be one of the kind of key aesthetic references to a lot of the ways we still think about designing technology, designing robotics, and designing things that look futuristic to this day. So it runs through quite a strong kind of thread of cultural representations that we still have today. If you compare, for example, Metropolis to the film Ex Machina, they were largely similar movies um, and used largely similar aesthetics to imply that this is a futuristic technology or that this robot is some kind of futuristic and new item. And so I mentioned semiotics before. There are some strong semiotic cues that we can understand from looking at media representations of the future. And these aren't just things that we see in science fiction. These actually transfer across from science fiction into product design. So whether you enjoy science fiction or not, it is one of the ways that we culturally try to understand the future. And so it's given us these cultural ideas of aesthetics, like the ideas of using artificial colours like silver, white and blue, which are very rarely seen in nature. And if you think about my um, idea of how these influence product design, think about the colours that Apple use in their products. Primarily Apple products are always silver and white. Things that seem artificial are often smooth and often minimal. So in nature it's very rare to see any kind of minimal, smooth, kind of design. Nature is often very complex. Um, nature is what's given us fractals and given us kind of very chaotic aesthetics. And then there are also cues for the technological that we see in design as well. So metallic surfaces, which we can trace all the way back really to the industrial revolution and the association of new kinds of machinery with technology and with progress. And the machinery side is also key. If you think back to the image of Maria from Metropolis, there was an idea of a suggestion of exposed machinery, like exposed parts in the way that her body would be made to move through robotics. And we see all of these design cues in modern wearable technologies and in modern digital technologies. So essentially, we have a set of cues that have been really strongly embedded in our minds about how the future looks. But we don't only have these cues for how the future looks. We also have these cues for how the future functions. So this is an example from 2002 um, of a holographic gestural interface. And it's interesting in that really this predates any kind of technology that works well for a gestural interface like for example leap motion controllers, if you're aware of those, they tend to work with virtual reality. Um, those were developed roughly, I would say, 10 years ago. So the time lag between the representation of a particular kind of interface in science fiction, in the media, and its actual development is interesting because often the interfaces that we see to technology are pre or sort of pre-suggested or pre-explored in fiction, in the media. And this has actually become quite an acknowledged trend. So this image I chose because it's actually part of an illustration in a book called Make It So, which is really interesting. It's a survey of all the science fiction interfaces um, from various kinds of science fiction movies from the 60s through to now and the way that a lot of them have actually been implemented or have influenced interface design. So these kinds of functionalities, like um, in the image you see here, include, again, holographic and gestural interfaces that you see in the Iron Man movies. And these aren't quite developed yet, so these are still emerging interfaces that haven't been perfected in real life. But we have a strong idea that these will be a future for interface design.
So again, our idea of functionality for digital technology is being preconceived by the media. Now, I mentioned that this was an acknowledged process, the influence between media and technology. There's quite an interesting project that was started by Arizona State University for exactly this reason. And the story goes that one of the professors of English literature at Arizona State was having a conversation with one of the professors of engineering. And the professor of English literature complained that the engineers hadn't built anything new to inspire the writers. And the professor of engineering complained that the writers hadn't written any new kind of utopian aspirational future fictions that the engineers could try to manufacture. And so they started a project to actually try and create better imaginaries, things that weren't dystopian, things that were positive, that the engineers could then create for. And they did this by pairing up creative writers with engineers to work together to come up with potential near future scenarios that could actually potentially be built. And so the project was called Hieroglyph and it was actually published as a book from uh, the Arizona State University Press. And this really kicked off the whole idea behind their um, Center for Science and the Imagination. And so they still work on this relationship to this day. So, our ideas around future technologies can predispose us to expect certain functions or can give us an inspiration to build a certain thing. And quite often, one thing that we need to consider more is whether these functions, whether these predisposed ideas of how a new technology behaves are actually useful or acceptable in the real world. So sometimes technology can be developed without a consideration for its social impact. And that's why the next theme I want to talk to you about is socio-technical imaginaries. Now, this is quite a complicated term, but it's really looking at beyond fantastical futures, how the imagination that I've talked to you about of what the future is and what's coming kind of pervades our everyday life. And it weaves through ideation and development. So if you're a designer, how you develop something but it also kind of influences our lived experience and the context that we imagine it will be placed in. And quite often that's forgotten in some technology development processes. So this is a definition by Sheila Yanisov, who writes quite a lot about the idea of the socio-technical imaginary. At first it seems quite complex, but if we break it down into smaller parts, it's actually relatively accessible. So she would argue that a socio-technical imaginary is a collectively held and performed vision of a desirable future. So that means that it's not just one person's imagination of the future. And this is critical. So when we're thinking about socio-technical imaginaries, they're not just your imagination of the future. They're an imagination of the future that comes from your immersion in society, in culture, and that builds on shared beliefs around technology. And so I would criticize one aspect of this in that I don't believe that they just refer to desirable futures. And I'll tell you a little bit about some of the ones that can actually relate to undesirable futures in the next slide. But so they're collective ideas around technology. And she goes on to say that they're animated by shared understandings of forms of social life and social order. So that really just means that these visions we have of desirable futures for technology are always related to how socially we interact, how socially we order our lives, and whether these things will be acceptable, will be useful in our lives. So remember that I said that not all technologies have been designed that way. This is where the idea of the socio-technical imaginary is like slightly differs. And then in the final section, she says that these shared understandings of how technology can inform our social life and social order um, are attainable through and supportive of advances in science and technology. So that really just means that not only is it things that new technologies can give us, but it can also be collectively held ideas we have that mean technology will develop in a certain way. 
So that's the idea of something being supportive of advances in science and technology. And this is why I've talked to you already about pre-designing the new and how that can happen. So I'm going to start giving you some examples and hope this will become clearer as I do. So this technology I find particularly interesting. This is the Ori Smart Ring and it's designed to be paired to a smartphone. Uh, it's created by a company called Ori as well and it's available in the shops now. The interesting thing about this ring is that it's actually marketed as a way to cut down your screen time. So this highlights actually two socio-technical imaginaries that we currently have in society at the moment, and they're both very easily recognisable. So the idea is that we use screens too much, which is very common. That's very prevalent. I think most of us feel like we do use screens too much, but actually this has never really been proven scientifically. It's just a collectively held notion we have around how we should be using technology. So if you look at some of these headlines from The Independent, which is a relatively balanced British newspaper, they don't really agree. They pre present very different attitudes to whether something like screen time is good or bad. And often with very new and very unfixed and undeveloped technologies, we find there is this conflict between kind of different imaginaries that don't necessarily work together as well as you would think they would, and as well as they would for a well-developed or for a kind of perfected technology. So this is contrasted with this idea that if we use screens too much, then technology should be the solution to help us use screens less. And I'm sure you can see the logical contradiction in that. But this is another really strong imaginary that it's very hard for us to get rid of because ever since the Industrial Revolution, when technology really did enable people to have a very different quality of life, um, the new the things that we were designing made a real difference socially to the world. We have an understanding now that technology is the solution. And it's interesting in times when we're considering things like degrowth, things like sustainable behaviours, that we still believe that technology is the solution. So we have this incredibly strong imaginary that technology benefits our lives, that technology makes things better. And yet it sits side by side with an imaginary that screen time is bad. And again, that relates to quite a lot of the moral panics around lots of technologies. For example, radio and television were both subject to quite extreme moral panics when they were first introduced. So that is a particular technology that's unstable, that's uncommon, has these two conflicting ideas associated with it. Now another interesting technology to illustrate that point, um, probably much more famous, is Google Glass. Now Google Glass was a real commercial failure because it caused so much controversy. So this was an example of Google creating something probably without fully understanding the social impact it would have. Now the issue with Google Glass is that effectively people were worried they were being spied on. So people were worried about their privacy, people were worried about their rights to anonymity. And it ties in with all sorts of social understandings of whether we have the right or not to be looking at someone, to be capturing media. And so Although we're used to working with visual technologies, most of our technologies that we currently engage with are visual. Um, the idea then that you put a visual technology near the eye seems logical, but it doesn't account for these ideas of when something is acceptable to record, who owns the data that's recorded through it, and who has that right to capture the data. So it also relates to some of the ideas around the theory of the gaze in feminist theory and the idea of the assumption of the right to be able to look at something, the right to objectify something through visually capturing it. And so it opened a very, very kind of complex ethical dialogue around technology usage. And so again, that's a case where a new technology has these conflicting imaginaries, these conflicting imaginaries of 
your right to capture and record data, the simplicity, the ease of use of a visual interface next to the eye, and then the really strong ethical reasons why being able to capture data just by looking at someone was not accepted in society. So I hope those give you a little bit of an idea of how some of these ideas of imaginaries, ideas of socially held beliefs, can relate to the impact or the reception of technologies. Now I'm going to very briefly talk to you about some of the case study research that we did for the InTouch project, which my PhD research has been part of. So in this research, we used the concept of the socio-technical imaginary to frame an exploration of some of the desires, concerns, and preoccupations that participants in our research studies had. And so we set up various research contexts for this, and they were all design related. So we created a workshop asking participants to prototype a new digital touch technology for communication. So thinking about how they imagined that touch might be used to communicate remotely between themselves and a loved one. Uh, we also invited visitors to an exhibition which was primarily using touch-based technologies in the art pieces that were exhibited. We invited the visitors to that exhibition to discuss their feelings and to discuss how playing with these new technologies might have changed their opinions or might have made them think differently about digital touch. So these were the prompts that we were hoping would get them to think about this new world of digital touch because although we are understanding now that there's different ways that we can send touch digitally. We kind of think that the majority of it is through vibration like we would experience in a game controller or in a mobile phone. And some of the more subtle forms of digital touch that can be sent and received or captured are still emerging technologies. A lot of them are still lab-based. So the ability to, for example, send heat or pressure or capture the heat and pressure of for example, a handshake or touching a different surface. And these are things that are being researched now. And the aim of the InTouch project really is to understand the social impact these technologies might have so that before they're rolled out, before we have these kind of moral and social panics like we did with Google Glass, we can try to anticipate what similar touch-based technologies might do. So, these images are currently some of the pictures of participants in our prototyping workshop, which was a very lo-fi workshop, just kind of developing things using everyday materials to try and represent a touch communication technology. And then on the left, we have some images of the art exhibition where we interviewed participants. Now, from these contexts, we started to look at some of the narratives that participants spoke about, particularly things around continuity and change and how they imagined touch might continue in ways they were familiar with or change based on its digitization and how our habits around touch might change. So a lot of the case study studies showed that the tactile affordances of current technologies and the combination of those with current social norms of touch shape these future visions. So when I talk about social norms, I talk about what we see as currently being acceptable, what we see as currently being normalized behavior. And they also brought histories around these ideas of norms and affordances of technology into their visions for the future. So I mentioned this idea of bringing established ideas of touch technology into a future design. This is taken from another case study we did working with student designers on the interaction design um, course at Loughborough University. And we were really interested to see what kind of blocks they would have when trying to design a touch-based technology. And it was very interesting that from quite a large student cohort, the majority of the students ended up focusing on vibration and focusing on actually controlling it through an app, even though there were a world of different possibilities. 
And this is something that I've seen in other kind of tech development processes with different students, that often because we're so used to our world being controlled through apps and phone screens, that this becomes a way we pre-design our new, our new ideas, our new products, our new technologies. So it's really just an extension of current ideas of interaction. And in the case of these designers, when they were working on touch-based interactions, it was extending forms of touch they understood. So it was primarily using vibration. But quite interestingly, because we're used to vibration as an alert or as a prompt to do something, um, a lot of their designs involve vibration as a way of correcting or disciplining the body. So things like correcting posture, for example, this design idea in the slide was created to correct posture in rugby players. And so there were lots of designs that had this idea that touch actually in this context was a correcting or disciplining thing coming from the idea of vibration as a prompt. And then in another study as well, which was a device which we built to try and send and receive some of the more complex aspects of touch. So this was an e-textile device which I helped create that would send pressure, vibration and heat between two remote participants. And although it looks a little bit like a pair of oven gloves, the idea was that putting your hand into one of these gloves, you would be able to feel what was being sent by the other person. And so the textile itself was embedded with vibrotactile motors and uh, heat pads and also inflating sections to give you the sense of pressure. And this was interesting because we asked the participants who worked with this prototype technology to think again about how they would communicate with it and whether it felt like they could communicate as they wanted to through this prototype. And it was interesting that they really kind of focused on the ideas of presence and connection. So instantly, although we think of touching with our hands, their reaction was that touch was a whole body experience. They wanted to feel these things over the rest of their body as well. And that also, to touch quite often communicates presence. For the participants, it communicated a sense of being with someone, which is more meaningful than ever now we've had the kind of COVID-19 experience and understood what it means to be separated from people physically over a long term. They were really keen that this kind of technology should give the chance for people to feel like they were present, like they were together for a longer term than just a text message or a voice message. And they also brought in their understandings of the difference between how you use text and voice messaging. The idea that with a mobile phone, we're always connected. So it's an always on, anytime, anywhere mode of communication. And they were quite keen that the touch communication wasn't like this, that it was private and that it should be something that maybe happened in the home or in a fixed space and somewhere where you could take the time and it didn't feel like, for example, phoning someone while you run for the bus or trying to fit in a conversation with someone when you have some free time between activities. It was something that they wanted to really contrast with this idea of current mobile communication and all of our imaginaries around how we communicate through mobile phones. And so they brought in this idea of creating a different space for communication. And that was particularly because some of the participants who used this device imagined that it would work in virtual spaces so that it would be combined with some kind of space, possibly VR, possibly even just Zoom, to give people an additional experience. But one thing that was interesting was that the social norms that they applied to what was acceptable in terms of touch came from the virtual space rather than the real space. So their norms and their imaginaries of what was acceptable were related to where they were experiencing themselves being. So that virtual space and not where they were actually located, which was actually a contrast to the idea of wanting a fixed space or wanting a different kind of communication to a mobile phone. Because in that sense, it was something that could be taken out of the real world and into another space. And it wouldn't matter where you were located because your social norms came from that virtual space. 
So there was quite a lot of interesting things that we managed to unpick from all of these studies in relation to people's socio-technical imaginaries of digital touch and how it contrasted with their imaginaries of current technologies and current experiences with technology. So I'm going to close this presentation by introducing you to Gartner's hype cycle and just getting you to consider the idea of hype in relation to technologies. So hype really relates to how much media exposure something has had, how much we've been told that this new technology will revolutionize our lives, will make everything better, will make everything different. And we've seen this with a lot of technologies as they've emerged fairly recently. For example, 3D print in particular um, has gone through stages of being hyped and being kind of portrayed as a solution to a lot of our problems in design and manufacturing. And now it's starting to bed down in a way where we're starting to understand what it can really do. So the hype cycle is mapped on this curve, which you can see in the image, begins at a fairly low point, and that's the innovation trigger, as Gartner described it. And that's where something is developed as a new technology. And from there, it rises and rises in terms of hype to what they call the peak of inflated expectations. So this is where we've heard so much about a technology that similarly to the 3D print example, we believe it can solve all of our problems, that it seems like the ultimate technology we can do anything with. Unfortunately, technologies very rarely stay there. So the next part of the curve on the downslope, um, the kind of trough at the bottom, they call this the trough of disillusionment. So that's when we become disillusioned with a technology. We realize it won't do everything that we think it will. And maybe it's not as good as we thought. And then from there, we progress up again on the graph through the slope of enlightenment, where we find out what the technology is really useful for, into what they call the plateau of productivity, where finally the technology is used for something it can genuinely be productive for and can make a difference. However, it's not at that same peak of hype and of expectation. So I hope that this presentation has given you an overview of some of the ways that our social lives, our experience of the world, and the social understandings we're enmeshed in can actually influence our design process and our understandings of a technology. So I want to ask you to think about what your social imaginaries of wearable technology are. So in this lecture, we've explored the ideas of the future being pre-designed. And so what are the aesthetic and functional assumptions you're making in your designs? Can you challenge them? Do they come from a pre-designed idea of the future? And in some cases, are they relevant and are they useful to helping people understand how they might use your technology or how they might use your design? because sometimes challenging ex expectations where it's not related to utility, where it's not related to function, can actually lead to alienating people. So it's a delicate balance to consider where you can challenge an assumption or a pre-designed future, and where it might be better to incorporate some elements of the semiotics of future designs. In this lecture, we've also explored the idea of the socio-technical imaginary as a kind of analytical concept that you can bring to your understanding of new technologies. And within this, we've thought about what the hopes and fears people have for different technologies may be. So consider what your hopes and fears are for wearable technologies. Are they realistic and what are they based on? Are they socially widespread notions, in which case they relate to a socio-technical imaginary? Or are they your own personal ideas? In which case, maybe it's worth exploring a wider social imaginary among your peers, among friends and colleagues. In relation to this, what social norms are you imposing on technology usage? So how do the ways that people normally use technology currently relate to the way you're expecting to design for or with a technology? And then in relation to the Gartner's hype cycle, is your choice of a technology to work with based on hype, or is it based on utility and what it has the potential to do?
So I hope you can consider all of these things in your design process, and I hope that's made it clear how relevant they can be to developing a genuinely novel, but also a genuinely useful wearable technology. So thank you for your time. The research that was mentioned from the InTouch project was supported by the European Research Council, and if you're interested in finding out more, this is the Twitter handle and the URL for the project. Thank you very much.